Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 211th podcast video cast for the week ending October 31st, 2023. Happy Halloween. We did a little of that celebrating over the weekend uh, in town and at the club, and they've had like three Halloweens already. That's Mimi in her costume. Uh, a couple family photos before we get started. There are Mimi and Annabelle. Uh, there, again trick-or-treating that's at the um at the club party on sunday and there's the family crew uh you know it's funny uh one of the bartenders at, at the club asks always asks me every year well what are you going to be next what are you going to be for halloween and i always say do you remember what i was last year and they go no i go yeah that's what i'm going to be this year so there you go uh, stick with the Stetson hat. You never go wrong in the cowboy boots. So uh, there you go. Um, so doing it on Tuesday because I've got to go down to Florida uh, for the next few days. I have a insurance company board meeting for a company I'm on, a friend of mine's company. And then I'm also uh, excited to meet in person for the first time a couple of clients in Florida. On, uh, new and existing one from uh naples and one from coming down from tampa and i'm staying in boca grande for the meeting uh very excited about that then playing uh, i think it's Coldwater creek or one of those clubs pretty excited on thursday and then on fr uh and presenting uh also at the board meeting kind of market outlook as well and then on friday uh late friday uh work in the morning driving over to the East Coast, and I'm going to play with my buddies Gene Mulak, who taught me how to golf. Uh, he's the former pro from our club. He now works for Clear Golf, best golf balls in the business, by the way. And then uh, Mike Bennett, who, along with uh, Andy Plummer, uh, wrote the book Stack and Tilt. And for those of you who don't know that, uh, what that is, by the way, here he is on the cover. Uh, and uh, I had Mike up to my club a couple of weeks ago when he was in town. I've never seen someone hit the ball like that. I mean, I have one client in Montana who's unbelievable. Uh, it just hits the ball down the fairway. Every single hole drops every putt in, uh, you know, and just goes out and knocks in a 71 or, or 73 or whatever whatever it was. It's just so consistent. When, when Mike hits the ball, it is so pure and it is um, just baby push draws every single time, which is stack and tilt. And this whole swing, you know, at one point when they were teaching, uh, he and Andy were teaching golf pros, they had seven of the top 100 PGA Tour pros on their teaching roster in one year. And uh, the origin of this is uh, kind of the Homer Kelly golfing machine. And then Mac O'Grady uh, was a big proponent and they just refined it and made it amazing and just... Uh, Nicest guys in the world, so super excited for uh, late Friday to get out with them and then fly back Friday night and et cetera. So um, quote of the week is Warren Buffett, price is what you pay, value is what you get. And we are in an environment where everyone's paying attention to price. No one's paying attention to value. And as long as I've been in this business, that changes, and when it changes, uh, it changes abruptly, and uh, periods like this give us an opportunity to get into unbelievable business as at incredibly fantastic prices, and we're going to talk about two today. We're going to try to make this one a little bit shorter. I've got to get up at 3 a.m. tomorrow, so i uh, going to bang this out, but um, let's go into a couple of uh, obvious things here. Number one, 10% correction on the S&P 500 garden variety. Um, they, they happen once a year on average. We just had one, not fun at all, but par for the course. And um, here are the number of pullbacks on the S&P since 1930. So happens every year. You know, usually after a year as abrupt as last year, you can, you know, uh, sometimes you get a little respite and maybe you get, you know, three to five or five to seven. Uh, this year, you know, a lot going on. You got a couple wars, you got famine, pestilence, uh, disease, uh, everything under the sun all at once. You know, a bunch of idiots in Washington. That's not really news, but uh, it is what it is. So um, you take advantage to the best you can. 
This is a weekly chart from uh, Bank of America Research and Bloomberg, just showing basically the weekly chart with 40 week and 200 week moving averages based on the rising 40 and 200 week moving averages at 42.52 and 39.45 respectively. The S&P remains within cyclical and secular uptrends. The July through October drop below the 40 week moving average represents a correction within these bullish trends. If stronger seasonality can take hold in November, uh, reclaiming the 40 week moving average would confirm the view of a correction within an ongoing cyclical and secular uptrend. We've covered similar stuff in recent weeks, but this is kind of interesting where they, they point out since uh, 2011, these major flushes and then these uh, double checkbacks before you get multi-year rallies, major flushes, double checkbacks before you get multi-year rallies. As a matter of fact, we reverse engineered this last week with 10 or 20 indicators. So you can go back and look at those kind of interesting that they're doing it here. Um, and then same here, major flush and then two minis before you get a multi-year rally. And I think that's really what we're on, on the cusp of here and positioned accordingly. Uh, back to the future here with Ryan Dietrich's post average seasonality. We're here, we're ready for the year end rally. And I think everything's pointing to it. Uh, Jay Capel, how many people would be surprised by this? Economic surprise index crossed above 50. So you can see Citigroup economic surprise index here. Um, uh, most economic data surprising to the upside, including earnings, by the way. And then um, uh, typically a useful clue. So you can see that when you get those type of signals, uh, uh, win rate is 88%. You're up a year later, double digits. Then uh, healthcare ha selling has plunged to a very low level. The healthcare sector has been dead money for two and a half years. So why aren't they selling heavily? Well, at these points of drawdown, uh, one year later, uh, on average, up 18.27% with a 100% win rate. So that's pretty exciting to see. Um, GM CEO Mary Barra quote from the conference call. I thought this was interesting via the transcript over on uh, uh, Twitter. We've been consistently talking about pent up demand from the last couple of years, and that's been really evident. While we hear reports out there in the macro that the consumer sentiment might be weakening, we haven't seen that in demand for our vehicle. So the look through for Cooper Standard, we're going to see their report on November 1st now, which is tomorrow. So we'll have a lot to talk about next week. But um, it'll be interesting to see with the strike now over, although the contracts haven't been ratified, uh, how positive the management wants to sound because obviously the OEMs are going to be going to get going to be getting squeezed on costs from the labor so I don't think the suppliers want to get out there and say hey we've never been doing better uh you know blue skies ahead when the uh OEMs just got kicked in the teeth because uh of the way that they handled the strike and um um really uh, <laughs> anyway uh so I would say um, I don't expect them to, you know, they've played it very coy the last few quarters, despite the fact the numbers have been very good. I wouldn't be surprised if they play it coy, but look through and look at the data. If you see the cash position improving, if you see the volumes uh, improving, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're moving ahead. I mean, the big, as I said, the biggest risk was last year, the refinancing, we got through that. And then this week, if the strike lasted, you know, materially longer, they could have probably lasted another month or two, but uh, probably two plus, but the UAW would have ran out of money within weeks, not months. And that was our bet. And that proved to be correct. Uh, and the OEMs blinked. So uh, all in, it worked out fine uh, um, on balance. So Lisa Abramowitz, the benchmark small cap index, the Russell 2000 has hit its lowest levels since November 2020, when the world was still without a vaccine and shut down from COVID. I think that's a huge opportunity. That's all about regional banks. We like that story. Small caps uh, on average here, Seth Golden uh, have, it's their best seasonality of the year is November and also December tends to be good for small caps. So that would imply uh, regional banks start to get bid. And I think if the Fed gets out of the way tomorrow, and uh, the 10-year stay, yield stays below 5%, which it has been behaving in the 480s uh, for the last week, then we could probably see some relief there and small caps and banks could rally into year end, which would be really, really nice to see. 
and probably the beginning of a trend for many years to come. As you can look here, these multiples don't get this low very often. The last time you had this chance was 2009, March 2009 lows. And if you bought small caps there, you made a fortune. And prior to that was the 2002, 2003 lows. And that was a monster rally from 2002 to 2007 for small caps. So ignore it at your own uh, missed opportunity. So uh, moving on, Stanley Black & Decker. Last Thursday, we had a bunch of great things happen all at once while the market was crapping. We had the, like the only three green stocks in the market. But uh, Stanley Black & Decker bounces off five months low after big earnings beat and raised outlook. So that's just beginning the destocking story we've been talking about multiple times on this podcast. Intel shares crushed it. Strong guidance. They're, they're actually going to be a competitor to NVIDIA. It's happening with their Gouda and uh, some of the new things they're developing. And that's before the Foundry you know, dream ever gets started. So uh, that's pretty exciting to see. Amazon gained 6% after strong Q3 print. So that was a good day. Continues. Amazon profit triples as sales show resilience leading into holidays. Uh, VF Corp activists see stock doubling. So they put out their whole plan. Actually, the, we're going to talk about that and show you from the horse's mouth, the new CEO, that he's actually following this activist plan. And um, so we're excited about that. He kitchen synced it last night. We bought some today. Uh, here's from uh, Market Watch. More Americans are car shopping despite the UAW strike and high prices. So that confirms what Mary Barra is communicating in her conference call. McDonald's stock climbs after earnings and sales price, uh, sales rise above expectations. So the rumors of uh, cheeseburgers demise in America were greatly exaggerated, uh, as was the case with all of the stuff. Dexcom, which is a diabetic uh, medical device uh, company, they blew earnings out of the water, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Nelson Pelt gives uh, Disney stake of gets Disney stake a former Marvel executive as he battles for board seat. So he's got basically control of the vote for another, uh, I believe another two and a half billion dollars. Uh, excuse me, $4.2 billion. This is uh, Perlmutter who sold Mar Marvel to Disney in 2009 and kept his stock. So between him and Peltz now, they've got $6.6 .6 billion of the vote. That, that, that's not too shabby. Um, Manhattan, Manhattan stalled office le leasing market poise for late year boom. People are forced back. There is no more work from home, at least if you're in a serious profession in New York City. Everyone's going back to the office. These buildings are filling up and we happen to own a piece of the best buildings in the best city in the world through Vernado. Uh, GM UAW and Stellantis finished the uh, UAW deal. So that's good to hear. And now they're ratifying it, but there's nothing to ratify. I mean, they, they got so much more than anyone expected. Uh, they completely outplayed Barra and Ford and uh, Stellantis. It's just mind boggling, uh, but uh, it is what it is. So how's this year's hottest investment could wind up costing you money market funds are seeing record interest but advisors say cash is no substitute for stocks and bonds i think that's going to be the case i think you got a record opportunity to buy long duration uh longer duration bonds with higher yields uh and and the equities minus the magnificent seven like the uh, the opportunities are just unbelievable and we're going to go through two stocks we own today that um, um, we think if you look at over time uh, represent an incredible opportunity. Obviously, this is opinion, not advice. We don't know your financial situation or your risk tolerance. Talk to your financial advisor. We deal exclusively with accredited investors and qualified institutions. Uh, so read the terms before you think about uh, thinking about uh, doing anything. Um, OK, we went through the office space. Okay, now on to the China stuff. Uh, more China companies buy back shares as Beijing seeks to stabilize market. U.S.-China agree in principle to Biden and Xi summit. Alibaba singles day pre-sale skyrocket with live streaming boost stock inches higher ahead of shopping extravaganza. So this game is starting. Uh, Beijing gets going with nine weeks left for 2023 top leadership is finally making a concerted effort to get the economy and external relations back on track uh stocks are starting to rebound and so on and so forth but again you know we got the first piece of it 
yields have stabilized. Now we need to get some confirmation from Powell. Every time he talks, the market goes down. Hopefully tomorrow will be different, uh, where he you know, uh, shows a tempered judgment and uh, says that the market has actually, the, the 10 year yield movement has uh, tightened financial conditions to the equivalent of another four rate hikes, three to four rate hikes, if you look at some of the quantitative data. So whether he's doing another one or not, uh, he'd be absolutely crazy to do it. And I think he needs to actually kind of tip his hand in that direction tomorrow. And if he does, then we're going to start to see the dollar weaken. We're already seeing uh, the Bank of Japan leaned in a little bit uh, with yield confer let, let yields uh, move up a little bit, starting to unwind yield c curve control. So that should be uh, short term, it was negative for the yen. Intermediate term, I think that's going to be positive for the yen, negative for the dollar as those yields start to go up. Um, uh, and we get the weakening dollar, we get the emerging markets trade back. Uh, China continues to produce over 95% of Apple's products. So for everyone who uh, is overweight Apple and is afraid to own China, you know, uh, I, I don't even have anything to add about that. U.S. rolls back China COVID flight curbs again in air travel boosts, so that's a positive development. Why China's National Financial Work Conference this week is very important. Key decision since 1997 and what to expect this year, so that's a big thing coming up. Uh, Alibaba's cloud unit now serves 80% of Chinese tech companies and half of the country's AI language model firms, group chairman uh, Joe Tsai says at the Aspara conference yesterday, mind boggling. So yeah, we've always talked about 38% of the country, but 80 and 50% of what matters in terms of future growth is just beginning. Pretty exciting stuff. Chinese tech uh, giant Alibaba launches upgraded AI model to challenge Microsoft and Amazon. So what they can't do in chips, they're going to outdo in software. And they talked about that at the conference and uh, you could read the article here. And then moving along, China home sales decline slows in October amid policy support starting to kick in, that's positive. Then you had factory activity shrink last night. So more people are calling for more support. Maybe you'll get it coming out of that major meeting. More China companies buyback shares is big. Uh, okay, we covered that. Now, article of the week, the weak sisters flushed stock market. Uh, no sentiment results because those come out on Thursday, but we'll get those next week for you. So slowly but surely, we're getting all of the weak sisters flushed out of undervalued great companies while they chase into overpriced momentum vehicles that are set up for a fall. Despite the garden variety headline correction of 10% in the S&P 500, under the surface, weak hands are getting flushed out of some of the best businesses in the world at clearance prices. Like I always say, by the way, my favorite mug from my friends in Dallas, as I always say, Wall Street is the only store in the world that when they mark down inventory at clearance sale prices, everyone runs out of the building. Uh, let's look at two examples. So here's PayPal. You can see the chart. The stock is down 85% from the peak in 2021. Here's a business trading down 85% in its peak. These sellers are not stupid, but they may be overreacting from fear. So what are they afraid of? They're afraid of two things. Number one is declining margins. Number two is increased competition. So on the declining margins, they bought Braintree. Braintree is a white label uh, uh, product. It's basically a commodity product that has lower margins than PayPal, which is a branded product. To give you an example of the value of the PayPal name, if you, if you have PayPal on your website versus the unbranded product, your close rate, rate on, uh, with a PayPal button is 90%. Your close rate with no PayPal button is 50%. Um, so, Here's Bank of America's take on the imminent. So, that, so that's the declining margins, although you're going to see it doesn't show up in the numbers. And actually, Bank of America is talking about the turn happening in Q4 of this year and why. So we'll talk about that in a second. And then increased competition. So Apple Pay, that's been a fear for 10 years. That's not going to change. Number two was the Fed now was supposed to end their U.S. business uh, in July once they launched Fed now. Most banks aren't taking Fed now because they don't want to or, or rolling it out, even though they have access to it because they don't want to lose their fees. So it's not it's been an, it's been a nothing burger so far. 
Um, then you've got uh, Elon Musk saying X is going to be the next thing since slice, uh, best thing since sliced bread. And they're going to do financials. They're going to do a dating app. They're going to do everything. It's going to, you know, Twitter is going to tie your shoes for you. It's going to brush your teeth. It's going to comb your hair. I mean, is there anything it can't do? The only difference I would say about that is number one, uh, number one, I wouldn't, I would never bet against Elon Musk. But number two, he, um, he's modeling it after the Chinese app. Um, um, it's the everything app in China. It's slipping my mind, but Le I think it's Weibo or and anyway. The point is that unlike Tesla, which was largely government financed, uh, otherwise it would have been bankrupt in the first few years. He got, you know, I think I'm cuffing these numbers, but it was well over. Uh, it was multi billions of dollars. For, first off in terms of federal subsidies, in terms of kickbacks, in terms of financing in the beginning, it's been tens of billions of dollars if you add up all the EV credits and uh, other abilities that he had to sell those credits and everything else uh, throughout the years. So so that was not a natural win, but he knew how to play the game. And and uh, and you, I don't take anything away from him for doing that. I think it's, it's uh, changed the world. I think it's not an understatement. Um, SpaceX, again, largely financed from uh, payloads from the government, as well as um, private enterprises taking up satellites, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Twitter is not, or X, uh, the everything app, is not going to get any financing opportunities from the government or any special uh, handouts. It's going to have to win on its own. And it is a very crowded space, which has been the weight on PayPal, but, but PayPal is an entrenched moded business, very hard for a startup to uh, come. And, um, and in the case of Twitter, their valuation has been marked in half because in the last year because number one, he overpaid, and number two, they've lost uh, followers. I think that I want to see Twitter win. Uh, I like Twitter. I use Twitter a lot, uh, but I will say like, Every day, there's a new impersonator of Tom Hayes with a fake account, and like you know, I'm paying a subscription to X, and they can't even stop people from taking my photo and impersonating my account and DMing people about Bitcoin, which I've never talked about in my entire career. So um, before they knock out PayPal and Visa and Mastercard, they might want to figure out how to get rid of uh, bots on their website, which is uh, seems like a simple task. Uh, before they uh, think they're going to take out entrenched, um, uh, moated, durable, embedded, incredible businesses around the world. So uh, that's what I would say about that. Here's Bank of America's take on the imminent turn. Transaction profit pressure could start to ease in Q4. PayPal's transaction profit growth has been in seen increased pressure recently, primarily due to mixed factors such as Braintree, unbranded volumes, which skew heavily to large merchants and card funding growing much faster than branded. So that makes sense. Uh, we believe that starting in Q4 2023, uh, transaction profit growth will start to gradually improve as PayPal laps some one-time headwinds. Loan loss pressures recede uh, because they got rid of the buy now pay later. If you remember, they sold that portfolio to KKR and branded total payment volume growth accelerates. We don't think total uh, uh, transaction profit growth acceleration is discounted in the shares, which we view undervalued at 11 times uh, calendar 24. Well, it, now it's less than that, it's 10 times, including uh, stock rates comp, maintain a buy. Okay, so what should investors be focused on? So what they have been focused on, um, okay, so what they should be focused on is right here, the numbers, okay, and you can see here, since 2015, revenues per share have gone from $7.56 to $29.20, and I'm sorry, $28.90 estimates for next year. Free cash flow has gone from $150 to $550. Earnings per share have gone from a buck to $420. Uh, common shares outstanding have declined uh, from 1.2 down to 1.0. Revenues have tripled from uh, 9.2 to 30, 31.5. And finally, return on capital, is, it's been a consistent compounder. So they've got 435 million active users, uh, 23 billion transactions were completed on its uh, platform last year, 
and it's gone from trading at 12 times sales just two years ago to two times sales today. It's fallen from an unrealistic 87 times earnings in 2021 to a bargain basement 10 times earnings today. And the core philosophy of what we do at Great Hill Capital can be summarized by one sentence from Warren Buffett. Quote, great investment opportunities come around when excellent companies are surrounded by unusual circumstances that cause the stock to be misappraised. The quote, temporary impairment realized in 2022 when earnings and cash flow dipped has since recovered back to trend. See above in green. So you can see here, cash flow dipped from 465. So it was going up every year, 460, uh, 287, 460, 465. It dropped to 329. And now it's back up to five and expected to do 550 a share next year. Same thing with earnings, dropped you know, from 352 to 209 back up to 375 and it'll continue to grow. Uh, the five-year long-term earnings growth rate is projected at uh, just under 17% a year, which implies a price to earnings growth of just 0.59 times. For general context, three times is expensive, greater than three times is expensive, uh, less than two times or one times is cheap. This is now less than one times. Uh, we call that buying with a margin of safety. Now the key, when approaching these opportunities is zero to minimal leverage. If you think you can pick the exact tick after an 85% drop, you are in fantasy land. However, if you model out the worst case, best case, and trend assumptions over the next three to five years and estimate fair and value in the neighborhood of $150 to $200 plus, does it really matter if you buy it at $65 or if you buy it at $45? It really doesn't matter, especially if you buy some at 65, some at 55, and some at 45, who really cares? Only if you're dumb enough to use too much leverage will you miss the opportunity. So like Munger says, there are only three ways a smart person can go broke, liquor, ladies, and leverage. And I would say uh, in those contexts, uh, uh, too much liquor, more than one lady, uh, or excessive leverage. Uh, I think if you have one, uh, the right lady, it's, you're a huge win. Uh, I'm lucky to have that. Uh, liquor is not my thing, never been, uh, and leverage not my thing either. Very, very modest. Uh, and what Buffett says, if you're smart, you don't need leverage. And if you're not smart, you shouldn't use it. <laughs> so there you go. Taking the lower case target of $150 over 36 months from present levels, you wind up with 41% IRR. This will likely outperform the S&P by four times, but in exchange for that benefit, can you sit through a possible short-term drop of 20 to 30% from forced sellers, structural selling who are on leverage and are getting liquidated at the bottom? Uh, it depends whether you know what you own. The sad fact is most market participants are buying this price. See these squiggly lines that are useless and mean nothing? Well, that's what they're buying. They're basically buying the short-term fluctuations known as the quote, voting machine from Ben Graham's intelligent investor. When they should be buying this, cash flow, long-term fundamentals known as the weighing machine. So here's what ca cash flow has looked like for, for, from PayPal since it spun out of eBay in 2015. Just up, 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 up. Even now when everyone hates it, up, up. So it continues to move in the right direction and price continues to go in our direction where we want to be buyers. Since PayPal's 2015 uh, spin out from eBay, it has generated $29 billion of free cash flow. They've used $19 billion to buy back stock. PayPal will generate a record $5 billion of free cash flow in 2023 alone. To put that in perspective, they could take the entire company private within a decade or less. Additional catalyst, which I think is critically important, is to always bet on the jockey, effective as of September 27th, Alex Chris assumed the roles of president and CEO, succeeding Dan Shulman, who will remain on the board until May of 2024. Chris came from Intuit, where he ran the small business and self-employment group from 2017 forward, which represented the majority of revenues for the company. See the blue lines below. So you can see here, this was the vast majority of the business. Uh, here were his key roles at the company from 2008 to 2013. 
when the company peaked at a 38 bagger. It went from, from 2008 to uh, 2021, it went from $18 to $707 per share, $18 to $707 per share while he was in major roles in the last five years of that parabolic run. He was in he was heading the most important vast majority of the business division uh, with the small business and self-employed group. So he's, he was there for 19 years and played a significant role in this 38 bagger move. If anyone understands small business growth acquisitions and how to manage and perform to Wall Street expectations, it is Alex Chris. But please be my guest and sell it in the hole on the next five dollar pullback. But when you do, just ask yourself the following question. Who is buying from me at these levels? I'll give you a hint. Number two, VF Corp. Last night, VF Corp's new CEO did what most brand new CEOs do when they come into a turnaround situation. That is book a kitchen sink quarter. Take all losses at once, release all the bad news, cut the dividend and lower expectations so everything moving forward is good news and you exceed expectations in the Wall Street earnings game. That's exactly what Brack and Daryl did last night. While VF Corps actually beat on the top line and came in within shooting distance on the bottom line, they took all of their medicine at once by cutting the dividend 70% and pulling guidance. Wells Fargo did this in 2020 before it doubled in a few months. Vornado did it earlier this year before taking off from the low teens. And most recently, Disney did it as a new activist, Nelson Peltz, entered the fray with a $2.5 billion position. It's always darkest before dawn. So here are some operating highlights uh, just before you think everything was wrong. As a matter of fact, they're shooting the lights out in Europe. Sales were up 14% year on year. Uh, Greater China was up 8% year on year. Uh, the Americas is what was down 11%. So what they need to do is rejuvenate the Vans brand, which was down 21%. Uh, their wholesale was down 1%. Direct to consumer was down 3%. But their North Face is their prized possession up 19% year on year. So there's a lot of good things happening. They just got to get Vans going uh, uh, in the U.S. And in his interview with Jim Cramer last night, uh, Daryl laid out a clear four point plan to return the company to greatness. This is a spectacular interview and we're going to listen to it briefly now. Let's look closely to VF Corp, the footwear and apparel company you know as Vans, North Face, Timberland, Dickies, Supreme, and many others. Part of what we call a kitchen sink quarter. This summer, the long struggling company brought in Bracken Dow from Logitech. Remember him as the new CEO, and now he's got a real tough job. But he's also got a great track record. Logitech up almost 750% for the time he took over in 2013 through the time he retired this summer. You know, that's uh, more than triple what the S&P did. Tonight, Daryl took his first step toward turning VF Corp around. The company reported inline sales with slightly weaker than expected earnings. And more importantly, it straight up withdrew its full year earnings forecast, slashed its free cash flow guidance, slashed its dividend, and warned that fan sneaker business wouldn't get better this year. We call this a kitchen sink quarter because management throws everything bearish in there. Get ahead of things. What's the plan for a turnaround? Let's check in with Bracken Dow, the new president and CEO of VF Corp. To get a better read on the situation, Mr. Dow, welcome back to Mad Money. Hey, it is so good to be here, Jim. I couldn't wait to see you again. I feel the same way, Bracken. And I think that what you have done is taken on like you did with Logitech, a very tough situation. You're no stranger to tough situations. Can you kind of give us a sketch about what you've been thinking in the first 100 days? Yeah, you know, I, I could be more excited. You know, as you said, you know, I, I had a turnaround when I got to Logitech. I had a turnaround long ago, my first job on Old Spice. And uh, so I'm kind of accustomed to being there. But I'm a very long-term person underneath. And so I'm, I'm only doing things that really looking for a really long-term migration. I really see four things that we need to do, Jim, in short order. And then we'll have a bigger strategy that will follow. The first thing is our U.S. business has always lagged the rest of the world. So we're taking the same approach we've taken to, to EMEA and to APAC, and we're applying it to the U.S., and we're going to put it under under one leader, very strong leader. And so that's step one. Number two is we're going to deliver the Vans turnaround. You know, Vans has been in a decline for a couple of years now, came off a very, very high number, now it's coming down. We're going to deliver that Vans turnaround. The third is we're going to lower our cost base. You won't be surprised at that. So we're going to do a $300 million restructuring, really reduce the cost across the board, and reinvest back into innovation and brand building. And then finally, we're going to delever, lower our debt, 
and really strengthen that balance sheet. So those are the four key priorities, super simple, super clear, super, in, we're, we're really intensely after them all. All right, so what attracted you to this? I mean, Logitech, I, we all use the devices. We all use them ever since you were there. You uh, introduced so many great ones. Why this task right now for you? Well, I loved Logitech, and I had such an incredible time there. But, I, I, you know, I was getting towards the, I turned 60, Jim. And so I decided, you know, if I'm going to have one more go at something in a public company arena, it's got to be something I'm excited about. And this is not just one brand. It's really an array of brands. They're household names. They're all deeply embedded in the culture. They're super powerful. And the business needs to turn around and, and, and turn back into something. These brands, we already have some of this stuff is just on fire. I mean, the North Face is a phenomenal brand. And Vans has the potential to get back to being one. Supreme's super interesting. Timberland's like a, a part of the hip-hop culture. So I just got very excited about not just the categories, but the brands themselves. Well, let's talk about something that you said as one of the top priorities. You said you have to deliver, number four. How can you deliver without selling some of these offerings? Well, we, we've announced that we're going to sell a very high-performing asset, by the way. It's called the PAX business. It's East PAC and Jansport and Kipling. That business continues to do very, very well. So that is that is going through a sale process. We're in the middle of that now. And between that, we we uh, announced we'd lower our dividend today. Right. So that's another contribution to delevering. So when you add that up with our performance, we will delever and we will, you know, we've got two tranches of debt coming up, uh, about a million, a billion seven fifty in total. And our intention is to pay off both those off. OK, now, what is an analog that you can give me of a sneaker turnaround? They're hard to find. An analog, you know, I, look, I have a lot of respect for uh, what New Balance has done. Yes. Yeah, I think New Balance is a great story. Great story. I mean, I, you know, I, I was never a New Balance customer, but I, but I remember New Balance when I was growing up, and I thought of them as just a running brand. I think they've done a super nice job. Yeah, they are doing. It's a great example of what can turn around. Now, you know, I came back from Iceland recently, and I wanted to recommend this before you got here. I said, well, I got to find this VF Corp for the club because when you're in Europe. North Face is the that's the most predominant brand. How can that happen yeah. again here in the United States? Can that occur? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, the, the bottom line is the, the, the platform that we're running in Europe has been in place now for several years. And it's just had success across all our brands. So we're going to bring that platform right into the U.S. What is a platform? It's a way of doing business that basically transfers best practices across the business very, very quickly and effectively. So, yeah, I absolutely think that the North Face can be as strong here as it is in Europe. I know that you're a guy who would say, Jim, you can't look back, you just look forward. But I remember uh, the in initial VF Corp because it was very close to my home in Pennsylvania. And then I heard they had to move to North Carolina because that would be close to where the mills were. Are, are there any mills in, in, in Colorado? Is that, that move make sense in any way? No, we're, we're out of mills now. But the, the, the one thing that Colorado has is it's very close to those mountains, those Rocky Mountains. And the North Face is all about being in the mountains and outside. Um, so, so I think from that standpoint, it's a very good thing. We also have these brands called Smartwool and Icebreaker, which if you haven't, if, if you've never tried one, they're amazing. I mean, Smartwool, it's merino wool brands that are really a certain kind of merino wool that is very, very comfortable, very warm, very breathable and natural. All right. Well, that's a good example of something I didn't know and why I think that you're the right guy for the job. There are people who say, Jim, he's a tech guy. How could he be there? I think you're a brand guy who is very aware of fashion and what people like. That's what I always felt you were ahead of in Logitech. Am I too optimistic? Do I am I making statements that perhaps I, I'm going to regret because Bracken Dial's going to take a little <laughs> longer time than I, than I, I hope he does? My job is to make you so right. That's absolutely what I'm going to do. Well, I believe it. I, I think that one of the things that you uh, understand more than anyone is, is that there are brands that have a technical nature, actual technical yeah. that people really like because they're authentic. You have got these brands. Some of them are technical, but some of them are just kind of like out there. And I look, I have to tell you, when I see the Vans decline, I think, what was the what was Vans that it became something else? It was an authentic brand and it seems like it became a knockoff of itself. Well, you know, I think what Vans really was for those. And, and I hope that there are some people listening who are big Vans fans. What Vans really was was inside all of us, there's a little bit of an underdog, a little bit of an outsider. Not everybody, but almost everybody. And that, and Vans really catered to that through the skater community. But it was really for all those people, whether you skated or not. And I think we got so big 
and we, we ended up kind of catering to other people that were just purely into fashion, that we, which is not bad, but we kind of lost our way on really making sure we're always appealing to that, that slightly, slightly mischievous, fun side that we all have inside. Now, is that also like Timberland, which at one point was just the shoe that you wanted to climb a mountain with, then it became a hip-hop shoe, but it, it, then it became kind of just another boot. Yeah, you know, Timberland, it's so associated with hip-hop. This is the 50th year anniversary of hip-hop. You probably knew that. If you didn't, you do not now. And it's also the 50th year of that boot, of that wow. beautiful boot. We just, we just created a movie that's really amazing. Susie Mulder, who runs our business, and her whole team created this movie that is just, it's worth watching. I don't know well, where you can watch it yet. I'll, I'll try to make it available, but anyway. it celebrates the fact that this really was part of the culture, Timberland, and, it, and, and our goal is to really leverage that. Well, I hope you will come on repeatedly because you're a straight up front guy. And by the way, I am pulling for you, okay? I'm just straight up. Not about friends, about money, but I am pulling for Brack and Dow, VF Corp president and CEO. <laughs> hey, how great to have you back on the show. Great to see you. Thank you, Joe. Man, Thank money's you. back after the break. And we're back. So the new plan this time with a new leader, um, it comes in four points. Reinvent, this includes creating a centralized operating system in the Americas, uh, basically copying what they did in Europe that's working extremely successfully, uh, sharpening the brand's brand focus on sustainable growth, uh, new Vans president, and optimizing the cost structure uh, with $300 million savings program, the dividend goes a long way to do that and reducing leverage uh, to do that. They're going to sell their PAX business, uh, which includes East PAC, Jan Sport, and Kipling. So that'll, they'll get that money. It'll pay down debt and then people will stop to worry. By the way, a lot of these companies that are down a lot that are great businesses, uh, that have operated through many cycles with even higher interest rates. Um, it's just because analysts can't get their mind around what the environment will look like when they have to refinance. And if you look at just the Fed's dot plot alone, and I'm not saying that has any predictive power, but the Fed alone is telling you that they're going to they're gonna cut rates by 50 basis points uh, at the back half of next year. And the market um, just doesn't seem to believe it because um, uh, everyone's acting like rates are going to go up in perpetuity, it's, which is called recency bias. But if Powell gives any indication either tomorrow or in December that he's done and, and analysts can start to model the companies with any leverage on their balance sheet, financing costs will look like and how to uh, restructure and pay down some of that, then some of these equities can absolutely fly to the moon. But until it stops going up, so you know, we've been a week basically since we had that quote outside day, which we covered last week. Uh, as that holds and the yields behave, I think a lot of these companies that have debt on their balance sheet are going to start to get uh, uh, more sponsorship because people are going to be able to model out what it's going to take versus trying to hit a moving target from a car that's going 120 miles an hour in the last you know 18 months as rates have just been on this uh, nonstop straight straight march upward. Now, to put this disaster in context, revenues are down two percent. The stock, on the other hand, is down 85%. The last turnaround Bracken Darrell was responsible for was Logitech. Now, under his tenure, the stock went from $5 to $130. It was a peak 26 times bagger. Okay, so here you've got a new CEO at uh, PayPal who presided over 38 bagger. And then in VF Corp, a guy who presided over a twenty-six bagger. Okay, so Bracken started at Logitech in two thousand thirteen. Here's what happened next. So here's the blue line. This is when he started. Now, just for uh, point of reference, ladies and gentlemen, when he joined, the stock was down. How much? 82% from its 2007 peak when he took over in 2013, right here. Uh, but please be my guest and sell in the hole on the next $2 pullback. But when you do, just ask yourself, who is buying from me at these levels? I'll give you a hint. So we'll be back next week at our normal time and place with plenty to cover on general market outlook, Cooper Standard, earnings strike, resolution, and more. Uh, now, we've got ask me anything questions, so stick around. We've got a few great questions this week. 
Uh, first and foremost, you got earnings. By the way, you'll remember in recent weeks when I was on Charles Payne last, I said, look, estimates are too low, negative 0.4% coming into earnings season. I said, you know, estimates have been too negative by 3% the last few quarters. We're probably going to finish plus 3%. Well, guess where we are after 50% uh, of the S&P have re reported. Yes, we have a 78% beat rate on the, on the bottom line, 62% beat rate on the top line. But now look where earnings growth is 2.7%, which is 2 3.1% greater than when we started. So where were earnings? 3%, actually a little more than 3% too pessimistic. And I think that as all this exogenous fog clears, we're gonna be off to the races into the seasonally strong period of the year. Now, my, Matt Mitchell, uh, hey Matty, asked a good question here. Happy Halloween, hope things are going well over in Connecticut. Wanted to get your thoughts on t -Row. Uh, asked about this in the past, but now seems like a great opportunity to buy a business on the cheap due to some short-term headwinds. Long-term, the company has strong balance sheet, demonstrated high return on capital. It respects shareholders via dividends and buybacks. Best-in-class brand. Thanks, Matt. All right, so let's take a look at this one, Matt. All right, so it's down 60-some-odd percent. Uh, cash flow... Looks a little choppy here in the short term. It had a spike up and then came down. Uh, let's see here. So earnings peaked in 2020 or 2021. They've been cut in half. So is the stock. Revenues peaked in 2021. Uh, they're down, you know, they're off. Uh, looks like about... Uh, about 15 percent that's not nothing um they're still paying a big dividend 4.8 percent um yeah i don't like this drop in revenues to be honest with you uh it's not ideal but that's probably attributable, well, in part attributable to you've had a kind of once in generation sell off in both equities and fixed income in 2022. And that hasn't recovered materially in 2023. Um, and, you know, if you're bullish on both, then this is a levered way to play it. That's, you know, I definitely agree with that. Um, Let's just take a look here. Just look at the share count here. Yeah, so they've been taking the share count down pretty consistently. Um, but, you know, their aggregate business is, you know, it's really in a trough and it hasn't shown you know it's been down off peak you know two years in a row it's shown no 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 real signs of recovery yet that doesn't mean it won't i you know i think that um i think you're probably right on this one and i think this is a perfect case of um you know this thing's 60 percent off um you know, at seventy dollars, I'd be a screaming, raging buyer of this thing. At ninety, I'd probably be dipping my feet in the water, kind of thing. I don't, I don't totally love these businesses because you've seen a lot just get shellacked and never recover, like Janice Henderson, Invesco, some of the others. But uh, I think you're probably okay with this one. I probably wouldn't build the whole position all at once here. Uh, and it's probably going to require a lot more work. You got to just understand, like, what's the plan to turn this around? What? Am, let me, let me, let's see what's been happening with margins, because that's another worry. Because they're basically a bunch of closet indexers trying to charge high fees. It's not like, you know, they're like overweight Apple 1%, and they think that's active management relative to the index. And it's just like, everyone's wise to that now. So, um Let's 
operating margins. Yeah, so that's another thing. Their margins are down 20%. No, more than that. They fell, gosh, from 51% to 38%. Yeah. Uh, and their net profit margin is down from uh, 40 down to 25. So this is... Um, this, this you have to get a feel for what's happening here. These might be irre irre irreversible margin compression. I'm going to say that it could bounce here for sure. Like, I think you're spot on here, Matt, but um, I'd really like to see a seven handle, even high seven handles before I got conviction on it. And I'm perfectly willing, like, I don't love the business enough. Like if this went from 90 straight to 130 and I missed it, I would, I would literally wouldn't lose a wink of sleep. Like I'd just be like, eh, you know, it was, that was a trade. It's not like such an incredible business that I would feel like, uh, you know, I had a chance to buy PayPal or Alibaba at these, these levels. Like those are just unbelievable businesses. This, I, I can't predict the future of this business, but I think it's going to be fine. It's big enough. It has scale. They'll figure it out. They'll do acquisitions. They'll do divestitures that, you know, they were first movers. So like, it's kind of a melting ice cube, slow melting ice cube, but it's big enough that it, you know, it really doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, I think good work. I mean, there's nothing to really dislike about it other than like you have to understand how are those margins going to stabilize and or uh at least come back a little bit uh team the tap what are your thoughts on archer daniel midland i think we covered this one last week but um we'll take a quick look again EDM. yeah i don't i don't buy anything up i mean this you know I don't, so no, not interested, but I'll take a quick look at the financials. And if they're super accelerating off the charts, I might not deter you from doing it, but I personally won't do it. Um, I don't know where that thing, went. anyway, that's not working. Okay, so Archer Daniels Midland. Okay, so estimates for next year are that cash flow and earnings are going to decline, um, and you're getting well. You have a low multiple. Um, sales are accelerating. So yeah, I mean, all right, I get it. I get you. I get why you're excited by the fundamentals. The question is how much of this is priced in. So they're buying back shares in the last three years after they expanded the share count. Um, both low margins are operating. Man, this is a low margin business. Um, safety. I just don't like commodity stocks in general. I, I, I mean, with the exception of like when we were buying energy in 2020, when like, the margin of safety was, and, and even then we were buying like Exxon. So like, um, uh, let me just take a quick look at the long-term fundamentals. I, I, I think it's a, I think it's a good business. I just don't want to. I. I just can't buy it when there's not such a big margin of safety because the commodity businesses are just very unpredictable and you buy them when there's just nothing to think about. Like they got so cheap, so hated, like no one's ever going to use their services again. And you know, this business is going to be around forever. Um, but I just don't think it's cheap enough where I'd want to enter it forever. Um, at this price. Let's see if you can get it up. Oh, maybe that's it. No, that's years. That's the problem. Yeah. All right. Let's shrink that down. Cash from operations is declining. Uh, 
I mean, they had peak free cash flow two years ago. It's been going down since um, after recovering. But I don't know. I, I just, I don't think there's enough margin of safety at this price. And I understand the multiple and all that stuff. I, I would just say, you know, you've had this 4X run in a couple of years. Let it settle out. And in the 60s or 50s, we can revisit it. But I think it's, I think it's too early right now. Uh, Vitas Gioli, good podcast. General question: Do you get a feel about the market from observing your viewer metrics? How depressed are we? <laughs> uh, yeah. By the way, I get phone calls and I get uh, nasty, um, uh, nasty uh, replies on Twitter and nasty comments on YouTube when everyone's depressed and nervous and scared and on too much leverage. So yeah, you got, you, you know, uh, some of you have gone to, uh, you, you're about a, uh, a one on the fear and greed index. <laughs> uh, all right, my actual question is about how to look at debt situations. I look at Coms Comscope as a communications infrastructure provider with a lot of debt. However, there was a decent insider buying this year in the 3 to $7 range, and there should be some long-term tailwinds for network infrastructure to boost the increasing demand for bandwidth, et cetera, for AI applications. On earnings, the stock plunged a cozy 50%. One would think at some point this is cheap enough. How do you dissect these cases if they're worth a punt? Uh, this is all rates. So I think this is going to depend on the Fed. This is a leverage play, and until analysts can understand what it's going to cost to refinance these businesses, they're going to trade like they're going bankrupt. And um, because, you know, at 10% or 15%, they probably are going bankrupt. Uh, the problem is, in my view, I don't think we're going to 10 or 15%. So um, let's take a look here. Um, the only thing I don't like about this business is that it doesn't have enough data through enough cycles for me to you know get excited i'd love to see how this thing did through the great financial crisis how it did through the tech wreck you know kind of one-off huge bad situations um all right let's look at cash flow here if it's a debt issue still generating cash flow operations still uh they paid back some debt free cash flow good balance sheet. So here's the problem. They've got $400 million of cash and they've got $9.3 billion of debt. That's a ton of debt. Um, and they're increasing the share count. Gross margins are okay mid thirties, uh, low thirties rather, um, $10 billion of debt. Jesus. Um, <sighs> Interest expense is six hundred fifty million a year. And probably going up. How much cash do they generate? Uh, I mean, the problem here is they took on so much debt. In 2019, it went from just under $4 billion of debt to 9.8 billion. And it didn't even, it must've been an acquisition or something. It didn't even, improve their cash flow. You know, it was obviously non accretive. Um, 
you, you know, number one, rates have to stabilize quickly. Number two, you have to be damn clear. I don't like this either. You know, revenues peaked last year at 9.2 billion. Now they're dropping. So dropping into rising cost of capital. Um, I mean, unless you have clarity, you got to go through every single sell side analyst paper, bearish thesis, investor presentation, conference call, and understand what's their Hail Mary pass to turn reaccelerate growth because they're going to need so much cash flow to service that debt. And then you got to go through tranche by tranche. When does each mature? So you can see how quickly the debt, the cost of capital is going to go up. Um, and then maybe look, you know, maybe then you get a stock at a buck fifty, you get a trade up to nine bucks, but I, I don't. I don't see it. Um, this looks like a frontier before they went bankrupt. Um, I hope I'm wrong about this and I like what you were thinking about it, but that just seems choke worthy. I mean, that's just a, too much for, for, you know, relatively, I mean, I, I'm not saying small business, but you know, small earnings power business to have that much debt. There's a possibility if they hockey stick on the on the things that you're talking about, but you really have to understand how and why that's happening and have outside confirmation beyond what you know management is pretending. Uh, as far as what they've bought, insider buying, I don't know. You know, sometimes they drink their own Kool Aid. But um, let's take a look and see if it was anything um, significant or if they were just trying to say send a message to the market to buy them time on a refinance. Um, all right. So this was August. He bought, uh, this is, this is nothing. I mean, he bought $33,000 worth. That's a joke. So he bought, all right, 33,000, three times in August. So he bought a hundred grand. I mean, he's probably taken a couple million a year out of the company. And this is a director actually. All right. So th this, and then the CEO bought, $250,000 worth. This is the guy. Let's see. Was this an actual purchaser? Uh, okay, so he bought some at four. Uh, look, it's better that they're buying than they're not buying. I'll give you that. But um, with some of these other directors, you also have to see what else have they been involved in and has it succeeded, et cetera, et cetera. And then you bet on the guy or gal versus them just buying some stocks. Cause it looks like this guy just keeps buying. And um, yeah, I mean, there is some buying here, but that was mostly in May and August. So <sighs> this one's tough. You gotta, you gotta, you know, understand what's going on with their balance sheet, understand what's going on with the turnaround plan. Do they have any assets they can sell off to pay down debt or divisions that they can sell off to pay down debt? Um, and if you can get comfortable with an inflection, it's probably worth a punt for a trade. Um, but, you know, this is not meaningful amount of money. It's better than nothing, you know, a couple hundred thousand bucks, but it's not like, you know, it's not like any of these guys are putting up half of their net worth. Although I'd be interested to see management ownership of the stock. Um, so that's something else you could look into. So I'd be very cautious on this one. I think, I like what you're thinking. I just think this one might be a little bit too risky. So you either have to manage that by just, you know, sizing it accordingly. Maybe it's a 1% position that you're willing to lose in exchange for a four or five bagger if if you really believe in their story, but I would never put any meaningful capital into this. It's just it's very risky, you know, I, unless there are assets that when they liquidate the company, you're certain that they liquidate it for, you know, $12 billion and, and equity would get 2 billion, uh, then it's worth a look. But um, with that said, look, uh, we'll be back next time, uh, next week, same time, same place with a ton of exciting stuff to talk about, more about the Fed, about um, Cooper Standard, of course, we'll see their earnings, uh, and uh, the jobs report on Friday, Apple earnings are going to be important, so there are a lot of catalysts this week, a lot of good things going on, can't wait to get back, in the meantime, make it a great one.
Bye for now.